One great thing about being a librarian is you have to stay up on all the platforms because every user brings in their own. So I am, I don't know. I have my preferences, but I can handle all of them. <laughs> So thank you very much to Bert for inviting me to uh, join in the panel today. I think Letty just uh, gave me a great lead in there with her sort of overview of the ways different folks might be doing user studies and using that information for development. Um, it is heartening to see in Simon's study that there are people who still do use our library websites to find content. Um, I'm. It is absolutely the case that we are in a competitive environment for those first clicks or that, that starting point or use at all as far as Google Scholar and some of the other sources. But many libraries still have high volume through their particular portals. And I can say that I work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And we absolutely have a high, high volume of um, this sort of Thing. So what I'll be remarking on today is detailed in a great deal more in the Discovery Should Be Delivery User-Centric Principles for Discovery as a Service that I published on the Scholarly Kitchen. I particularly want to point this out, though, because at the bottom of that, you'll see an acknowledgment of my colleagues, Bill Michaud and Michael Norman, with whom I've co-chaired our Discovery Access and Search working group within our library, as well as a link to a presentation that they gave at CNI, which would give you more of the technical details about the way we are designing our discovery interface, whereas I will be talking more about the design principles, if you will. Now, these are not unrelated. They both draw on the same evidence base. But I wanted just to have that, uh, if you're more interested in sort of like the actual nitty gritty, uh, Bill in particular is your guy. So Bill is our, is a, tech person, Michael is a cataloger, metadata, and then myself in user services. So bringing a user-centric approach means serving a community of users and prioritizing its needs regardless of general trends or fashion. And that's a really important thing, which is not to say that we ignore the general trends or fashion, but at the University of Illinois, we know that our users are distinct and that we have a particular community that we as a library are charged to serve. That is both an advantage over maybe a general platform as well as a challenge for us. This, taking a user-centric or focused on a user community approach is often difficult because users do not always know what they want. They do not always do what they think they do. So I, I always appreciate Simon's and other people's surveys, but I'm also very interested in studies that actually look at what people do do as opposed to what they believe they do. Because we've at least had some studies we've done where we've asked people first what they believe, and then we ask them to show us, and they're doing something completely different than they think they're doing. Um, Users also change their practices over time. And I don't mean in the big trend way, I mean individual people change what they do over time. And so that's also an important part of us. Um, and then, you know, there's not a global monolithic user out there, you know, homogenous, right, that we have to look at. Even on our own campus, we can see those subpopulations. And then, of course, the biggest challenge of focusing on users is that they're not the non users. And so we're very concerned about who isn't using our discovery interface and what we would need to do in order to get them to use it. Is it because they don't know about it? Different kind of problem than I tried it and it doesn't work for me. So we, are, we set about to develop a strategy that responded to these challenges to focus on what usual users actually do and the choices they actually make as they do their work in order to reveal the behaviors and desires in our user community. So I mentioned the Illinois context. We're just big. All, all numbers are always big at the University of Illinois. So we'd like that annual budget of $16 million for collections to be bigger. You would probably like it to be bigger, too. Um, but it's big, right? I mean, that's a big number. Um, we have more than 40 million items in our collection, 125,000 online journals, over 80 da 800 databases. We just got our 14 million volume. Like, there's no number in our library that's small, which part of what's important about this is, in many ways, we can't rely on numbers to tell us what's a priority for our user community. Um, we have a 60,000 member user community with staggering online use, 8 million downloads of subscribed content, 1.3 million downloads from institutional repository, a million circulation transactions, just et cetera, et cetera. But here's an important thing. We know from doing Ithaca faculty survey 
that our faculty place greater importance on the role of the library as a gateway to information and express greater support for the role of librarians and institutional investments in the library than national averages. So that is both an asset that we build on as well as something that we take as evidence that we've been doing something right over the last decade um, in that sort of competitive way. The other reality is that no single platform can currently accommodate all of these materials, their related metadata and the usage levels from our community. So the evidence we've drawn on in making our principles is large-scale user surveys, um, particularly looking at the items related to discovery and open-ended comments. We've done user surveys for more than 12 years, and I've created an index with a graduate student so that we can go in and say, here's every time we've asked users about eBooks, regardless of the survey, what have they said to us over time? We also make extensive use of transaction logs. Because we have a locally developed interface, we are capturing all of those transaction logs, which we can analyze for descriptive data. So for example, we know that the average length of search has gone up and up and up and up. We also can distinguish pretty easily between a cut and paste search and a typed in search. And so we've developed um, mechanisms to sort of at least do a first pass through these logs. Um, we have also done sampling for query types where we actually put human eyes on a query and say what, what kind of thing were they looking for and known item a topical. And we've also done pathway analysis of when people do a search and then first they click into EBSCO and then they come back and then they click into Scopus and then like we've looked at that pathway of choices that they're making. We've also done targeted surveys, focus groups, interviews, usability studies. <laughs> And we always write reports to ourselves, too. And we have attempted implementation of WebFeet and Primo as well. And so we have, um, well, a failed implementation of WebFeet. Some of you don't even know what that is. It's fine. <laughs> uh, Primo, you do know, and we did have it for three years, but never fully deployed it. The results of our analysis led us to see that there's really a taxonomy of user tasks that we need to support, known item searches, um, being obvious, exploring the topic, but we also saw that people were seeking assistance, they were looking for research data, they were sometimes looking for a known research tool. So in our discovery layer, which we kind of conceptualize as how to find articles and books, they would type in psych info, right? So they don't want articles about psych info except a few LIS students. Um, <laughs> So these are the principles that we came up with, and I won't go over in depth with all of them, but a couple that I'd like to highlight. Library users want my everything, not absolutely everything. So the chemists are not desperate for that uh, music uh, composition article that used some sort of metaphor from chemistry in order to explain a concept in their field. Um, those are the simple ones. Um, but really, their notion of everything is constrained by their own worldview. Um, we really wanted to also, number five is my most important, which is to drive down the steps from discovery to delivery. So my point, my view is, if you've discovered an item and you have to click more than once to download that item, we need to try and shorten that path. We have shortened that path on our easy search interface for known item searches. If we can identify a PDF in the EDS discovery service, you will have one click access from your search results to that PDF. Um, using labeling that reflects user terminology is very important. Every one of us in the room can follow a whole bunch of jargon that our users cannot, and then they make things up about what it means, and often it's not correct. We also have this final principles I want to point out, which is that we always offer a next step. So one of the things that we also did some look at is why do people find Google and Google Scholar an enjoyable search experience? Like, people will say, well, I didn't find what I like, but, you know, I just like using it. And I'm like, why? Like, <laughs> and one of the things we saw is those systems always offer you a next step. So it never just says zero results. It offers you, did you want to spell it? Do you want to look at this? Do you want to? So we tried to adapt that principle in as well. And so you'll see that we've um, done a lot with that, including if we can identify that what they really are looking for, for example, is a database, we give them one-click access. And all DOIs immediately resolve through a one-click access as well. So the result is our website, which looks like this. The main easy search site is an open site, so you can go to our library website and just type a search you want into that very first box, and you will get this far. To get any further than this, you'll need to authenticate in most cases. Um, but you see that we have EDS, our library catalog, 
as well as we do an analysis of the subject area you have searched, if we can match it in, and tell you which library in our system serves you and which librarian serves you. We also recommend for databases that are not part of the discovery service that there are other databases in this subject area that we'd like to let you know about. So there's a lot going on on this page that I haven't deconstructed, but if you look at it, you'll see those principles in play. So thank you very much.